Man, the shot just needs some sauce. After years of waiting, Aperture has finally released their version of a tube, the Infinibars. Coming in hot with one, two, and four foot variants, are the Infinibars the revolution in linear LEDs that we all hoped for? Full disclosure, Aperture sent me these units for testing, but it doesn't affect my opinion on them, and they didn't get to see or have any input on this video before release. The first thing I wanted to test when the Infinibars arrived was the new connecting system that was all over Aperture's announcement video. Each unit comes with its own bracket that can be used to create a straight or right angle connection between the bars, and it also helps distribute power between them. Building the rectangle out of the four bars was as easy as can be. Those connections were super secure, and I was glad to find out that the seamless bezel selling point was an actual thing and not just a marketing gimmick. I didn't get any of the other bracket types sent to me, but there are a plethora to choose from that enable all kinds of shapes and designs. Because my apartment is made of all landlord special parts, I used the magnets on the back of the bars to stick them right on my door and confirm that the magnets would hold the weight of everything. A neat feature about the magnets on the two and four foot versions is that they're removable so you can place the bar flush on a surface. This also allows the bars to rest on top of one another for some interesting looks. And lastly, you can reposition the magnets when rigging the bars, something we'll get into a little later. After testing the connecting brackets, the next thing I was eager to see was the new clamp mechanism on the back of the bar. The machining on the clamp is flawless. I love the minimal look and I want to give a shout out to the engineer that led the design on that. It fits snugly into the recessed grooves on the back of the bar, tightens securely, can be relocated quickly, and it's intuitive and easy to use. Quasar deployed something similar with their double rainbow tubes, and while I think both of these are a step above any other mounting method in terms of ease of use and quality, I definitely prefer the Aperture one. The track system is recessed, so I'm able to lay the bars flat on a surface, and it's easier to reposition or replace the bars when I don't have to slide them along the length of the bracket. So how secure are the new clamps? Well, I popped them on opposite sides of my Infinibar rectangle and boomed it out on two C-stands. This setup isn't exactly the lightest either. The two-foot bars weigh two and a half pounds each, and the four foot bars come in at 4.6. The clamps themselves also weigh a pound, so this whole setup is about 15 pounds hanging off the end of some gobo arms. By clipping a cheap window shear from Walmart across the center, I was able to achieve a large overhead source in a really tight space. Before I brought the bars on set with me the next day, I wanted to confirm the claimed output specs as well as battery life and recharge times. I tested the output of both the two and four foot bars across CCT values and colors at a distance of three feet. Here's the values that I measured compared to Aperture's claims. I charged and burned the lights down a few times throughout the day as well to test both the battery life and recharging times. While the battery life on all the bars I received were within spec and is handily shown on the bars as they're used and updates as the power draw changes, Charging one of the four foot tubes takes a significantly longer time than what's claimed by Aperture. Maybe this is because I got an earlier production model or something though. The first real test for these units came over the following few days. The first day out, the DP wanted B-roll of our talent driving around in his truck, so I needed something that would both balance against direct sunlight and be mobile. Sounds like the perfect job for the new bars. I taped a two-footer to the dashboard for this shot, set it to daylight, cranked it to 100%, and it was just enough to lift the shadows, even in direct sunlight. This time, I'm helping to create training material for a dentist's office. The DP asked if it was possible to rig the Infinibars to play underneath the cabinets all day. The catch is that the rigging had to be minimal because the underside of the cabinets would be in frame. Normally, I'd use magnets and tape to solve this issue, but because of the weight of the bars, I was worried that the length of tape required to get the magnets in place would also end up in frame. We resolved the issue differently, but it made me curious as to how I'd do this next time. So I threw the question to my favorite gaffing forum and tested some of the responses. First up, alien tape. I wish the guy that told me about this would have also told me I didn't need four feet for the four foot bar. I think I spent like an hour getting the bar unstuck. Turns out I can actually just cover the magnets of the bar with alien tape and it'll stick perfectly flush underneath the surface. This one's going straight into the kit. It's the perfect solution. Then I tested 3M Velcro since it's the quick Walmart Home Depot run solution. Tested two pairs of large size strips on a four foot bar since that'll supposedly hold eight pounds. Supposed to set for an hour before you put weight on it, but nobody's got time for that on a film set. 
that, so I didn't bother with that part. An hour later, and the bar was still in place, so this will work in a pinch too. The only downside is the bottom of the bar doesn't have a large enough surface for the Velcro to attach to, so this can only be used to mount the bars facing out. Lastly, I figured out my own trick for when nothing is available but gaffer's tape. I resolved the tape showing issue by repositioning the detachable magnets on the bar. Slide them towards the center, and now the tape won't overhang the ends of the bar. If you're on a narrow depth of field, then to a camera, it just looks like part of the set decoration. It's hard to spend much time with these lights and not notice the phenomenal build quality. All metal construction means that these can, and did, take a few accidental whackings during my testing. The menu system built into the bars is intuitive, and I didn't find myself getting lost even when browsing submenus. One very appreciated feature is the ability to select how long I would like the battery on the tubes to last. This is great if I know I need the bars to last all day, or at least until I can get the next one charged. You can also do some frequency offsetting if you're shooting at higher frame rates and need to avoid flickering. The buttons to control the menu don't interfere with the mounting clamp either so it can be positioned directly over them if need be. Aesthetically, the bar design fits in with the modern minimal look of most locations these days so it looks more like a piece of set decoration and less like an obvious film light when they inevitably end up in frame. Just like everybody else, I was curious how the Infinibars compared to the standard workhorses of the film industry, the Astera Titan tubes. So I reached out to another owner op in my market, and the gaffer that you're probably already following on Instagram, Tyler Kashke, aka the Colorado Gaffer, to see if he'd let me borrow his for a few days. The biggest noticeable difference between the two when using them was how much easier it is to rig the Infinibar over the Titan tube system. The Titan tube system requires eight pieces to hold a single tube, takes a while to build, and it still has the issue of coming untwisted if weighted improperly. I also prefer the menu system of the Infinibar. I found it more intuitive to use and I didn't get lost in the menus so much. Light spread and output remain relatively the same regardless of which one you're using, although aperture is markedly brighter when entering RGB color space. One feature I'd like to see come to the Infinibars that's already on the Titan tubes in the Quasar Double Rainbows is the ability to saturate in color from any point in the CCT range of the unit and have green magenta adjustment. Since we're entering an era where color rendition matters more than pure output, and given who Aperture is competing with in this price bracket, it's a feature I'm hoping that we see in a future update. At $200 cheaper per unit though, and a similarly tank-like build quality, there's a lot of reasons to love the Infinibars over the several year old Titan tubes as a smaller market owner operator. All right, it's a few days later, and I'm helping create family montages for a company website. The bars worked wonderfully tucked under shelving for this, and I found the gaffer's tape magnet combo to be the quickest solution for easily repositioning the bars. We also recreated soft blue moonlight for a shot by taping both four foot bars to a curtain rail and blasting a couple 600s through the windows. Rounding out the end of my onset testing, I was finally able to get these bars on set for a short film. We rigged the two four footers onto an electrical panel to give us a nice nice, gross, green metal hue, and I screwed the two footers together to create a very portable key light. To help me control this key light, I was able to test the soft boxes that come with the bars. The narrow beam provided by a tube has its benefits and drawbacks, but for this film, it worked perfectly. By using a provided grid, I was able to key my subject without affecting any of the other subjects in frame. If we used a larger source for the key light, then there would have been more spill around the scene. Controlling this would have required additional flagging for every scene to get rid of, increasing our setup time for each shot and slowing down the day. One thing that made all my time on set with the bars so much easier was the Cytos Link app. Being able to group the bars and control both the two footers and four footers at once saved me so much time on set. This app also has some nifty features beyond just wireless control over the obvious features of the units. Source type is great when you know the type of light you want the bars to mimic. Source match is great when I'm on location and I want to have my hair light or my kicker light match the values of the overhead lights that are built into the location. I can point my phone anywhere, get my value, and within seconds, everything looks like it fits in place. Aperture is also programmed gels from both Roscoe and Lee, so if you're used to using a favorite gel, you should be able to find it in here. XY mode is useful for replicating very specific colors, as well as allowing you the option to choose which color space you'd like to operate in. Pixel FX is a crazy powerful tool to help the gaffer match VFX in camera. One way that I've heard of this effect being utilized is during All Quiet on the Western Front. In this scene, the flare is a real in-camera practical, but doesn't actually have enough light to light the faces of the talent. So the gaffer recorded a flare being shot using an FX tool like this, and then played that back on lights rigged to a crane to match the timing of the flare so that all the effects would work, be realistic, and happen in camera. Super cool stuff, 
I'm excited to see what some young and hungry filmmakers do with something like this. Sure, it seems like a lot of positives. So did I discover anything negative about the bars over the course of my testing? Of course I did. I'm never afraid to nitpick, so let's dive into some areas that these bars could be improved. First up, if the bars are advertised as being able to be placed in frame, then why is there no clean side to them? I either have the charge port or the warning labels in frame. Kind of a frustrating oversight. An IP20 rating means that these bars are strictly for indoor use only. When used in individual address pixel mode, the lights run in RGB and not RGB WW mode. One thing I'd like to see them do in future iterations to really seamlessly work in virtual production environments is have dual ethernet ports like the Dumble Rainbows so the Infinibars can be daisy chained together to reduce onset cabling. Last, when I built my rectangle, I noticed the pixel effects run twice on the two foot bars for every one time it runs on the four foot bar. This happens because the pixel effects are dependent on the length of each tube. Hopefully there's a future update that enables selection between centimeters per second and the amount of times the effect runs across all bars per second when we group them together. Let's wrap this episode up and put a bow on it. What niche do I think that these bars fill? Well, if you're a run and gun videographer who uses tubes mainly for their utility, then you can probably make do with the less expensive Amaran tubes. USB-C charging and a slightly longer battery life will make things much easier as you run around. But if you're looking for awesome pixel effects for your next music video or narrative project or lights that seamlessly blend into locations, then the Infinibars are easily the best thing on the market currently. Thanks for coming along with me on this journey. Hope you learned something. See you next time.